stage. Um, cool. So we're going to start to get this started right now. I appreciate everybody for coming. Uh, let me give me a thumbs up emoji, which can be found on the side of your screen. If you heard about us from an email uh, in order to get an RSVP. Cool. All right. I'm just seeing if that system's working. Awesome. Good to know. Woo, four. Awesome. Um, well, this, uh, this platform is something called RoomKey. And as you can all see, you are different characters that you've created. And you now control that character within the room. So if you uh, want to look around the room left and right, you simply just put your finger on the screen or you put your mouse on the screen, hold down, and then you can pan left and right to look around. And clicking different tables will bring you to the different tables. Each table has a private conversation happening. So anything happening at the tables is private and anything happening on stage is public. Um, so my name is Don. Uh, I was the, the person who helped get this company started a few years ago. And uh, it's really interesting over the last month and a half, there's been a, a big overlap between virtual reality and what we're doing and the crypto space uh, around virtual assets, the metaverse, virtual goods. And so what we wanted to do is bring in uh, two crypto experts and have them kind of just walk through a conversation. Um, Rohit has a podcast himself, but I'll, I'll let him introduce himself. But he has a podcast where, uh, you know, he does this on a, on a pretty consistent basis um, with some really well-known, notable people as well on the podcast. And so he'll be basically leading the conversation with his guest, James, JJ Sowers. And so can we give him a quick round of applause before I hop off on stage and let Rohit introduce himself? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, everyone, uh, for, for taking our time. Uh, as, as Don mentioned, you know, I put on a podcast called Life in Mastery, uh, where I, you know, delve into the world of venture capital, startups, funding, and thought leaders. Uh, it gives you a guide on how to get funding and analyze the tech industry and, and allow, you know, the business to have rocket ship growth. And, and both uh, James and, uh, you know, Don have been uh, the guests on my podcast. I've had uh, I guess like uh, James Clear, Kaya Kawasaki, uh, and uh, you know Fabrice Kinder and other VCs and entrepreneurs have been doing for the past three years. Uh, but about myself, I was uh, born brought up in, in, in India. I've been into tech startups. I was a very early employee for Travel Decacon called OYO Rooms. Uh, I've been into revenue uh, and, and sales and marketing roles. So you know, really excited to be here. And thank you, Don and, and Roomkey, for giving this opportunity today. And uh, I'm very excited to introduce James Sowers, who is a foreign American businessman and philanthropist. He's a, he's a former singer and songwriter who, is, uh, who had his music career, which was ended by a reckless driver in a car accident. And he's currently advising companies as a crypto asset executive. And he has invested in over 30 startups and, and a dozen you know, ICOs. He's also an advisor to a number of initial coin offerings. And he was recently interviewed uh, by the Huffington Post on his theory uh, featuring Atomic Friends. Uh, he's a contributor to Crypto Daily UK and ICO Crowd Magazine, uh, and uh, James is an early blockchain and cryptocurrency adopter. Uh, welcome to the show, James. Oh, thank, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I've been on a couple of your podcasts, and you did that one Angel Summit too. That was great. Great stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, thank you, thank you so much for always uh, being uh, kind enough. And, you know, we, we also did this angel summit where we had, uh, you know, a few of the angel investors like uh, James and uh, Fabrice Grindow, who's, who's uh, possibly the, uh, the most uh, famous VC from the European ecosystem. And, uh, you know, without, without further ado, I just wanted to understand, you know, what got you so interested into blockchain and uh, Bitcoin? And why do you think Bitcoin is, is so important uh, during these times? Yeah, so even before I could get into Bitcoin many years ago, it was it's not like now where it's easy to get an account with things like Coinbase and things like that, and you can Google it and watch YouTube videos. But when I heard, first heard about Bitcoin, I was like, wow, this is incredible. You know, when I heard about the technology, I said, this either this is going to be a zero or it's going to be revolutionary. So it's turned out, you know, basically over the last decade or so, it's turning out to be revolutionary. And I was like, this is like internet money. So you know how we originally had the internet and it had, you know, web browsing and things like that. Now we're evolving into the internet becoming money and the internet of value where everybody can even um, kind of 
make themselves more valuable and musicians and people with NFTs and artists, they're basically finally being able to get their just due. Yeah, interesting that you know you you talked about uh, NFTs, but I I I want to understand about you know uh, you know Bitcoin has as a fixed supply there around twenty one billion bitcoins that that has been issued at a at a fixed predetermined rate. Uh, do, do you think Bitcoin is is like an alternative asset to to gold, or do you think you know Bitcoin will also uh, be used by consumers and institutions going forward? Yeah, so a lot of people call Bitcoin digital gold. I kind of call it millennials gold too. So it is kind of a version of digital gold and it's growing into that. And I also believe in the future that Bitcoin is going to eventually have the same market cap as gold and then eclipse gold. I kind of look at Bitcoin too. The bigger the market cap gets, it allows institutions to participate. So, you know, when it was real small, less than 100 billion, they couldn't really participate because they couldn't get it in any size without really moving the needle. But now that we're at a trillion and we keep on growing, that eventually, you know, we get to 10 trillion. Sovereign wealth funds are going to put it in their balance sheet. Maybe, you know, 50, even 100 trillion, the same as real market cap as real estate. Then we're going to have like central banks put it in their balance sheet. So I definitely think when the early innings of bigger and bigger institutions coming in, you know, over time. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know what, what, what are NFTs? In, and I think in the last uh, couple of months, there's been a lot of uh, excitement about Meta Cohen, uh, who's, I think, a Singapore based uh, uh, investor who invest, who bought uh, uh, Beeple's NFT for 16, $69 million. So, so uh, just for just for everyone's sake, for the audience's sake, what, 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 are, what are NFTs all about? Yeah, so NFT is a non-fungible token. So Bitcoin is a fungible token. You know, Ether, Ethereum is a fungible token. But an NFT, they can be one of a kind or they can be a series of. So like, for instance, just use art as an example. You can have a one of a kind piece of art and it's one of one on the blockchain. And then when you buy that, like, like the one that the guy bought for Beeple for 69 point some million Sotheby's, it's totally one of, kind, one of a kind. So it's like super scarce, super rare. And... Um, there, there can only be one. Now, there's this thing called ERC-1155 where you can do a series. Like, you know how artists have prints, like one of 10, one of 12, where you could have multiple versions of something. But what really makes things valuable is the scarcity. And you can do it in music, too, where you can do NFTs. Okay, so it's it's, it's not only focused on art. It could be about music and other digital assets also? Correct. I mean, it can be for a number of things. I mean, people do them for things as just like um, membership certificates. Like that, there there's a um, company for clothing that actually issued these NFT clothings, and you had to be a member. You had to buy some of their DAO tokens, and then they had um, auctions for a membership to even be first access to buy certain pieces of clothing that were pretty cool that are done by you know they call them creators. So people who are creating these clothes, and then you have to be a member, and now it's on Open C where you have to bid for the membership. I can't think of it offhand the name right now, but it's it's pretty cool. So I really think there's a lot of opportunity for creators and people who are independent contractors to really use NFT technology to um, build their businesses and really make themselves scar. So it's kind of like everyone's branding themselves. So we're moving into a world where like influencers are eating the world, and it's really tying into technology. Right, and uh, you know. Uh uh, some somebody who's in, uh, who's into creating art and collectibles. Now, how can they create, you know, trade and license uh, NFTs? Right. So there's a lot of great platforms out there like Rarible and OpenSea that are pretty popular. And anybody can go on there and create an NFT. You just go on there. It's pretty self-explanatory. It tells you how to do it. It even tells you, you know, do you want to make just one of one or, you know, one of and you put the number in so it's more than one. And you can upload a JPEG of a picture of art or something you did. And on things like Rarible, too, you can get a verified profile. So it's true. Anyone could just upload. Like you could upload some NFT that I made or take a picture of it and not be me. But um, it's best to buy from verified creators and it's, it's not that hard to get verified you can get yourself verified by them and on open sea some things are verified and some things are not but they do warn you if it's not verified and a lot of celebrities lately like football players have been doing they call them drops of nfts on things like open sea and there's a thing called maker's place which is more of a centralized um system but you can buy nfts on there peyton manning just did one and they had some that were auction, some that had a fixed price. And Patrick Mahomes before him did one on Maker's Place. I actually bought one of the Patrick Mahomes ones. Got it. And uh, 
do you also need to have legal property rights for for buying these nfts uh, because you know when it comes to digital assets uh, you know uh, they, i mean when you look at physical arts like mona lisa uh, that that is there's only just one mona lisa but when it comes to digital assets it can be copied uh, or do you think there are going to be some legal property rights for for buying such these nfts Yeah, so now we're getting into a super gray area. And also on these platforms too, the great thing for artists is when they create these, you can receive a royalty. So if, if I buy it from you and then you sell it to the next guy, the original creator can receive a 6 or 10% royalty what's ever set up. Now right now it's a lot of trust being relied in between platforms that someone actually receives that royalty, but eventually it'll be um programmed in the smart contract, but there is some gray area and some debate like who really owns the IP of this. Because so for instance when you buy an NBA top shot you do not own the IP but you own the mo- they call moments you own the moment that you purchase but you do not own the IP Got it and uh, you know uh, going back to my Matthew's uh, thing which I mentioned of Metacol when you know who bought for the NFT for 69 million dollars uh, do you think a lot of law uh, uh, my first question why do you think he bought it for 69 million dollars and And, and my, my follow up is do you think it could become easy for independent creators to to go directly and do you know create an nft for for their own digital art so I, i definitely think it's it's easy for um creators to go to these platforms and create different nfts to promote themselves and to bring in revenue especially in art and especially music too and it's also a way in music kind of um where you don't necessarily need the record label anymore so if you're an independent musician and you don't have a record label now you have your own venue for distribution that you didn't have before and the great thing is too is it kind of makes it more um I guess personal with fans because you know it's a certificate of authenticity that hey I discovered this guy before anyone knew him and you can prove it because it's on the blockchain and you can also have different rewards and even these things called social tokens so I think that's great and then going back to why um Metacoven you know bid 669 million I mean other people were bidding and I guess he had a strategy and I, it's rumored he outbid Justin Sun so the bidding kept going up is the rumor in like the last 15 minutes a whole yeah. lot but Yeah, that's definitely a part of history. It was one of the first big, big auctions that everyone had ever heard of in the media. So there was a lot of hype behind it, and the fact you know this is like part of internet history. It's just like the Jack Dorsey tweet that was a couple million dollars. I mean, you know, I might not want to pay two point nine million dollars for Jack Dorsey's tweet, but some people collect like you know the first Apple computer, and there's different things at the um computer history museum in Mountain View. So who's to say what it's worth? Because that's a piece of internet history, just like this people work. Right. And, uh, you know, Metacoven said something, uh, something very interesting, uh, you know, he uh, recently, I think, came on uh, a Palm, uh, actually on a Palm, uh, Palm show where he mentioned that uh, he has, uh, he doesn't have a bank account, he's investing more into, into NFTs where he believes that most of the wealth would be uh, created on uh, digital assets and not on the physical assets like the real estate, uh, the f- uh, physical real estate, but uh you know monopolies on uh, you know digital assets be it, uh you know digital real estate digital clothing digital art uh, and you know there'll be monopolies over there uh, do you think it's it's little uh, too early to uh, to to say that you know uh, uh, a lot of wealth will be created on the digital real asset side I definitely don't think it's too early and I definitely think the directional arrow is the future heading there. So it's just like, you know, Wayne Gretzky talking about skating to where the puck is going. The puck right. is definitely going to NFTs, metaverse, social token, you know, virtual property is what I call it because inside of some of these metaverse things, you have different skins and things that they call them in games. There's different property that you can get that are technically NFTs in the metaverse and some of them are going to be very valuable. I mean, scarce scarce is a big thing so some of them you know if they make tens of thousands or something it, it might not be as valuable as something if it's only truly one of one and then some of these pieces inside these games they actually give you um more functionality and things like that like i'm not a big gamer or anything but i i, I understand the concept so i definitely think tremendous wealth in the future is going to be created in digital assets not only in things like bitcoin but things like digital art nfts um digital music things we've never even thought of Right. and uh, uh you know uh, uh cryptocurrency and bitcoin had an inflection uh, point last year where you know 
uh, uh, both uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a lot of other cryptocurrencies have, have really gone up. Uh, but do you think Bitcoin can be replaced by Ethereum uh, because Ethereum has a, a stronger network effects? Or do you think you know Bitcoin uh, will be will be uh, cannot be replaced? So I don't necessarily think it'll be replaced. The kind of, the way I kind of look at it is, you know, Bitcoin has its purpose. Ethereum has its purpose, and there may be like you know ten or fifteen or twelve different blockchains that have different use cases that are specifically very good at one specific thing, and it's going to be tremendous value created. I also kind of look at Bitcoin in a way, you know, the price being fifty five, sixty thousand. What if this is kind of like the new age DAO? So back like maybe I don't know if it was early nineteen hundreds or whenever they created the DAO, you know, that started out with a real low number, and now it's thirty thousand. And so I kind of look Bitcoin at fifty or sixty thousand. It could go to a million, five million. Who knows? And it's almost like the new age stock market, where the value is there. And then maybe Ethereum is like the new age S and P five hundred kind of for the, like the millennials and the Gen Z that they kind of see it that way. That they're going to be into these cryptos. And I mean, it's just like you know, memes have become a big thing, and that really means a lot to a lot of the younger generation. They really get that the community. So I think there's a tremendous value in that. And who's anybody to judge? You know, what's something like Doge is worth and things like that? Because the future, there could be tremendous innovation even with something like that. Right, and uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin uh, prices can can become very volatile. Do you think is the volatility of the Bitcoin price is it exaggerated? Whereby you know they can be a ten to fifteen or even thirty percent drop at times. Uh, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so definitely there's a lot of volatility in Bitcoin and Ethereum and a lot of the other cryptos. But right now, I think that may actually be the advantage of it because, you know, it's still an emerging kind of industry. It's still a baby. I mean, if it's only like 10 years old or whatever, I guess now really 12 years old for Bitcoin and, you know, five or six years for Ethereum going into that. I mean, it's still very, very young. So just imagine when the stock market and all that was very, very young. So the opportunities and the volatility because people can take advantage of that and average in because there's a lot of people say, oh, my God, Bitcoin. Bitcoin, you know, moved so fast. You know, it was twenty thousand, then it was fifty thousand. You know, I never got my whole Bitcoin, but you know, you can buy pieces of a Bitcoin. They call them satoshis, and you know, you can just average in over time. And there's going to be some corrections. I mean, there may be another in the history of Bitcoin. There's been several eighty or ninety percent corrections, and even now you get ten to fifteen, twenty percent corrections, and then it bounces back. So these are the opportunities for people who are long-term thinkers and they really want to hold on to this and they think it's going to be a tremendous value, you know, decades from now to get a larger position. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, crypto, you know, it does, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, debate that, you know, it's not regulated. It does reduce regulation and safety, uh, but it does increase access for, for people to, you know, uh, invest into uh, into uh, one significant asset. Uh, what What is your suggestion on how should how should people invest into cryptocurrencies and are there any safe exchanges or you know hardware wallets where people should buy into? Yeah, so it's not necessarily as investment advice because I'm not a registered investment advisor, but I, I agree there's going to be more and more regulation and some regulation is good because you know if you know an exchange like for instance in the United States a Coinbase, you know they have to deal with regulators and things like that. You know that there's box is being checked off and then there might be some other exchanges that has less regulation and you're not really sure you know well what happens if they get hacked are they, are they really going to be incentivized to replace the crypto things like that and then you have your know, decentralized exchanges you have centralized versus decentralized and there is value in decentralized exchanges because you remember they don't custody your crypto when you buy on uniswap or sushi swap or something like that or pancake swap you're actually holding the tokens in your own wallet so you're self custodying you know, in a software wallet, and you can move them to a hardware wallet. And there's a number of different hardware wallets. Different people have different opinions on them. But I always, one thing I like to think of is, you know, just your personal privacy. So even if the wallet itself is totally secure and people can't steal the crypto, you have to really think about, is the person I'm ordering this from, if they get hacked, is my sensitive data, not necessarily the crypto being stolen, but, you know, my name, address, my phone number, is that going to be out there and sold in the dark web? Because, you know, somebody could show up at your house if they have that. Like, for instance, there was a um, hardware wallet that they hacked them, but they didn't hack the wallet itself. They hacked their database. 
And supposedly, you know, people were getting like text and then people were stealing their crypto that way because they thought it was Ledger and they were asking for their keys. So never give out your keys via text or someone you don't know, obviously. But then also there, there's been home invasions and stuff because they had people's address or threats. So, you know, that's very dangerous. People really need to think about personal security. And, you know, I, I, would, I know they say like not your keys, not your crypto. But if you really have a large stash of crypto, you should really consider kind of decentralizing yourself and having some of it in places that do – um custody deep cold storage now they do charge for that and there are minimums but it's definitely you know if it's a seven figure stash it's probably not a good idea to have it in your home right and um you know lately uh you know some of the bigger institutions have started acquiring uh, uh bitcoins uh you know purchasing a bitcoins is uh, uh uh you know it can have a lot of security and technological issues but uh, if there are you know uh, listeners uh, in, in the room who uh, would want to acquire bitcoins for the balance sheet uh, what what is what is your uh, thoughts on that uh, should should companies look at acquiring bitcoins for the balance sheet just to hedge inflation so i think the company should definitely acquire bitcoin on the balance sheet and also um ether just part of kind of an asset strategy is reserve assets but also in case we do have a hyperinflation like a dollar you know really devalues i mean in theory you know everything priced in dollars would rise a lot but also too depending on what the gap accounting laws are as far as you know wherever you're um domiciled you can also lend out the bitcoin and get an interest rate so you know nowadays if someone had a billion dollars worth of bitcoin on their corporate balance sheet and lent it out at six to eight percent I mean, that's a whole new cash flow they didn't have. I mean, inter regular interest rates are basically zero on cash, and in some countries, they're negative. Right, and uh, you know, you mentioned about Bitcoin, and Ethereum. Uh, are there other other cryptocurrencies like you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, Dogecoin uh, and uh, you know, XRP, Litecoin, and a lot of other. Uh, alternative uh, you know assets do you think people should should invest into into those particular uh, cryptocurrency as well yes yeah, so i think individuals i just like to use the word participate um if they like a coin that resonates with them and you know, they can do their research and decide using critical thinking why does this coin resonate with me like all the people that doge resonates with i mean who was anyone to judge and say oh you know there's nothing behind that that was a joke mean coin because it actually is a technology payment rail now i'm not sure how much it's actually been used but it it can be used for peer-to-peer -peer. and recently i looked in github i think it was in february there was a new upgrade that talked about things they're going to be doing on it so i wouldn't be surprised if some people aren't building on there and it's just not a lot of information out there but um Definitely, if someone you know likes a crypto and they want to have some allocation to it, I don't see any reason not to. You know, as long as you don't put in any money you can't afford to lose or, or necessarily need right away, because these things are fairly volatile. But you know, yeah. if there's a strategy where someone wants to move beyond Bitcoin and Ethereum, and they want to hold other tokens, you know, ten or twelve or whatever, have like a diversified portfolio. It's almost like venture bets because you know, in, in venture investing, it's kind of unfair because only accredited investors have been allowed to participate throughout the years outside of you know the regulation crowdfunding. But in this case, with these crypto protocols, a lot of them are like liquid venture bets. They're liquid. You don't have to wait for an exit, and a lot of them have the types of returns asymmetric that some of these um venture bets have. No, absolutely. I think uh, investing into cryptocurrency is risky, but it is a lot more liquid than investing into uh, into you know angel investing or in, into startups because the liquidity is is already there. Uh, but for for people who who already into their twenties, you know, what percentage of of their net assets would you recommend should be into you know crypto assets or cryptocurrencies or uh, some of these NFTs and newer uh, digital assets? Right. So I always say that's a very personal decision, but I would say at right. least just as an insurance policy, people should probably have, you know, an allocation of 1% at least to, to a Bitcoin or if maybe if they want to mix it up a little bit with Bitcoin and Ether, because um, if you lose that 1%, it isn't going to ruin your life. But let's just right. say there was hyperinflation in the dollar or something and you lost 99%, that could ruin your life and the 1% could go to the moon and even average that out. But I, I really actually think that, you know, people should consider, you know, up to 5% or more depending on their risk tolerance. And when you're young, you have like your whole life to make it back. And, you know, if you go 5%, if, for example, somebody went 1% or 2% Bitcoin, 1% or 2% in Ethereum and 1%, even if they really like Doge, I mean, if those really take off, this could make all the difference in the world in your life. Or if they just want to, um, you know, kind of size it however they want and then maybe even do 1% in things like um, 
NFTs and things like that. You just got to kind of be mindful of the price and make sure it really resonates with you personally. Like I bought this one NFT of these dancing Shibas that's representing Doge, and I just bought it because, you know, it made me laugh. I mean, it wasn't that much. It was only like a tenth of a BNB, but um, it's priced in BNB because it was on the Binance Smart Chain. But, you know, I just thought, you know, getting enjoyment out of these things too, because remember, you know, it's art. Right. And you know, you know, coming to uh, you know digital currencies, uh, do you think uh, in the next uh, you know ten years or so we'll have uh, you know euro? Do you think it will be extend, or do you think a digital dollar or a or a you know Chinese yuan is, or digital yuan uh, will be there where the paper money will will be extend? So I absolutely think we're going less and less paper money. I mean, even before crypto really became a thing, you know, you have credit cards and it started moving like Apple Pay and Samsung Pay. And I, I believe that the Chinese have launched a digital currency. I don't know if everyone's being forced to use it yet, but they do have that. And I definitely believe that central bank digital currencies are going to become the new money and they're going to eliminate paper money. And then we're going to have our own wallets or accounts, for lack of a better term, at a central bank. And they're actually going to be basically communicating directly to each individual. So it's very interesting times. And I really think this is a new revolution. Like back when they had the railroads and the steel industry and the oil industries were being created, this is all be cre being created with the digital rails. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about, you know, developing countries, uh, especially uh, you know, Africa, Latin, and Southeast Asia, where uh, there's a lot of uh, accelerated growth which is happening, but the countries like Nigeria and India, where, you know, uh, it's sort of a gray, gray area where, you know, things are still not clear if you could buy Bitcoin and, uh, you know, the, the regulations against people uh, uh, to, to buy Bitcoin. Uh, do you think uh, uh, nations, uh, nation states would implement draconian laws which would uh, not let people uh, either either uh, uh, you know buy Bitcoin or create a uh, blockchain uh, you know assets over these Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I definitely think even the U.S. is going to be a lot of I call it regulatory fud. But I mean, Bitcoin itself is decentralized, so you can't really just shut it down real easy. Because before Bitcoin, there used to be people who tried to do things like hash cash. E gold, and you know, they just came in, the regulators, and shut down their servers, and that was the end of it. But you know, you can't just shut down any one server to end Bitcoin because it, it's decentralized. And I do understand, like, I had heard some countries have tried to put certain regulations or controls because people were using things like Bitcoin to get money out of the country because you know their currencies are depreciating so much and those governments are losing control. So I understand why they're doing it, but they can't stop this. I mean, this is. This freight train is rolling so fast, it's going to be impossible to stop. So I, I do think there'll be different regulations or talker regulations. But as, as the world keeps moving, moving more and more to digital, they're going to have to be adapt in some way to everyone being allowed to have some sort of Bitcoin or Ether or something of that nature. And people can always, I mean, I know it's not always easy to leave, but people can actually you know, leave where they are too and go to more friendlier places. And the places that are more friendly to digital innovation or innovation in general that's where all the smart minds and the great people are going to naturally gravitate towards. So in order to keep up you know, with the rest of the world, like India is going to be a rising power, most likely, as long as they don't overregulate, that they should um, basically you know, think about that before they set some of these rules. And I think a lot of these rules are just saber rattling, where they, they test them out and they take them back and they say people can't buy them, but then you know some people can still buy and it's decentralized, and maybe some people are buying on the down low. So I think it's really, really hard to, to regulate something like Bitcoin. I mean, you would basically have to have collusion where all the big G10 countries got together and the central banks and said, okay, we're all going to ban Bitcoin now. If anything, I would think these companies would adapt to tax it, like a property tax or something, so they could benefit off the gains of Bitcoin and they could earn more revenue into their systems, that they'll use it to their advantage. Right, and... Um uh, when do you think you know uh, consumers and merchants will start using Bitcoin? Because uh, you know I've been seeing the growth for a long time, and I thought you know more more people would be using Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, for for the either you know uh, for for selling off uh, trading their assets or or uh, using it daily. But that hasn't really happened. But do you think a change would happen, an acceleration because of COVID would happen, and it would be much sooner? 
So we're definitely heading in that direction away because PayPal now has, I don't know if it's 26 million merchants on the platform that can now accept Bitcoin because of the PayPal rails. And I think more and more, you know, and Venmo I heard added it too. But the way I kind of think about it too, as, as a person, why would I want to spend my Bitcoin if I think it's a store of value and it's going to be worth, you know, millions of dollars later per, per token? Why would I want to use that? you know, it's commerce. But as far as Ethereum goes, people are using that because of the gas fees. So when you do anything with NFTs and things like that and doing things on Uniswap, I mean, you are using kind of Ethereum as money to pay for fees. So I think there will be some people, you know, spending Bitcoin in a way through the PayPals and things like that. But as of right now, especially when it's going up a lot, I could see a lot of people not wanting to basically spend their Bitcoin because if it's going up, why would you want to spend it? It's your store value. It's almost like, you know, the new Internet money. It's your Bitcoin savings account, especially if you're lending it out and you're earning an interest rate. Robert, I, I think with, with Visa and PayPal actually, you know, creating a you know, roadmap where uh, they, they want to uh, implement Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, I think uh, it might accelerate, but it needs to be seen, you know, what are, what are the regulations going forward? And, uh, you know, when, when do you think institutions will, will start buying uh, cryptocurrencies? Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Warren Buffett, but, you know, some of Warren thinks that, you know, crypto uh, is, is a fad, but I'm also a big fan of Naval Ravikant, who, who believes that, you know, cryptocurrencies uh, will, will be the future, you know. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, and as, as, as we get technologists, we do believe that, you know, Bitcoin and and blockchain will revolutionize, but uh, but uh, with, the, with old school uh, banking institutions are still not uh, buying cryptocurrencies. In fact, HSBC and, and some of them, uh, a lot of these South Asian banks have uh, banned uh, you know uh, uh, trading accounts which are trading cryptocurrencies. But when do you think you know some of these old institutions uh, and uh, banks will start backing cryptocurrencies once again? Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting because some of the insurance companies like Mass Mutual, they're um, putting Bitcoin in the balance sheet. Now, granted, it's a very small amount of their balance sheet because they have so much money. But yeah, I really think a lot of it is, like you were saying, some of the old guard versus the new guard that slowly some are adopting. And I think as we get more regulation and more rules behind it and the market cap gets higher and higher, some of these things, even like so Warren Buffett, he may not personally like Bitcoin, but if the market cap gets the same of gold or the same as real estate, then, you know, Geico Insurance and some of the other insurance entities he has may put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. I, I really think it has to do a lot with um, more regulations so they know the rules and also the market cap getting higher. Because, you know, when right. assets get into the tens to hundreds of trillions, I mean, I guess one, I guess, you know, all the real estate's around 100 trillion all the gold is around 10 trillion i mean bitcoin's a little bit over 1 trillion so once bitcoin gets into the land of the 10 trillion i mean there's not many assets that are higher than that once it gets there once it gets the parity with gold because i guess in stocks you know we have like apple and saudi aramco and microsoft and i think maybe alphabet might be over over a trillion now on amazon but other than that you're getting into rarefied air when you have a trillion dollar asset and 10 trillion is super rarefied no, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, if uh, the asset reaches, you know, anywhere from five to ten billion dollars, I think, uh, sorry, trillion dollars is is when uh, you know Bitcoin would be taking lot more serious, which is already started having. But uh, uh, you know, uh, last week we had Coinbase, which was uh, uh, which was great for the ecosystem and uh, it was a great IPO. Uh, uh, yeah, but what I've seen is that there are a lot of uh, you know, wallet exchanges and, and and trading exchanges, which is which are done well uh, on on top of uh, Bitcoin. But uh, what are some of the uh, you know products uh, which developers and entrepreneurs are building uh, on top of Bitcoin? Um, I know, uh, you know Fred Wilson uh, had had uh, who's a famous VC from USV is backed uh, uh, Crypto Kitties, but. Uh, uh, but, but do you think there are other interesting products which are coming, which are built on the base of Bitcoin, but which are not just trading platforms? You know what I mean? So, yeah, there's an incredible amount of innovation on blockchain itself. And, yeah, there's people are building many different things on many different blockchains. So, you know, originally CryptoKitties was built on Ethereum. And then, they, you know, they, I think they had a different name, Axiom or something, and they 
changed it to Dapper Labs, and they actually created their own blockchain, the Flow blockchain. That's what the um, NBA Top Shots are on, because you know they because of the gas fees and for other reasons and the speed, they decided that they thought that was better. But I think there's going to be incredible metaverse products built on top of blockchains, and it could be different blockchains. It may not even be Ethereum. There's a Solano blockchain that is really fast, does 50,000 transactions per second. I mean, it's pretty robust. I think people are going to build derivative products on there, even exchanges. There may be even the future stuff. You know how we have like Robinhood now and things like that. There may be things like, for instance, you know how we can't easily buy Stripe stock. I mean, if you're an accredited investor, you can get it secondary shares. And a lot of times that's via an SPV. But I think eventually there's going to be derivatives where they don't even hold the shares. And it's going to be like Stripe stock trading, almost like a bet on the price, a derivative version on some of these exchanges. And it could be built on something like the Solano blockchain. And there'll be other companies, you know, that aren't public yet trading on these um, derivative types exchanges. And there'll also be even the shares backed by actual shares that might be in an SPV or something, secondary shares, that also trade on some of these exchanges. So I really think the whole future is going to almost the democratization of almost everything. And then things we haven't even thought of may trade on these exchanges. So I really think with technology and innovation that it, it's, it's just going to be incredible. All kinds of things are going to be built that we never thought of. And a lot of people don't realize, too, that with supply chain, that's an excellent use of blockchain. There's a company called VeChain that's doing incredible things in that. They have their own blockchain, and a lot of them, very big companies are actually using them to track, trace, and authenticate things. So, I mean, it, and identify. So it's, it's, it's very interesting, and we're still very you know young in this space. But over the next decade, incredible things are going to happen. And I have a feeling, too, there's a lot of test cases where people are either building their own blockchains as corporations or using blockchains as a service. Like I've heard now that Microsoft is actually trying to build something on the Omni layer, the Bitcoin blockchain, and offer some kind of service. Now, I'm not 100% sure how that's going to turn out, but, you know, it's Microsoft. They have unlimited funds, basically. They're going to innovate because Bitcoin is not turning complete and Ethereum is turning turning complete. You know, it's a state machine. That's why they have the Ethereum virtual machine. So it's easy to um, build smart contracts and stuff. But, you know, with enough time and enough innovation, people are going to bridge things where there may be some kind of bridge or some kind of composability where people are able to build on the Bitcoin blockchain and things like Doge. I mean, the, the future is open. It's like the future is so bright, I got to wear shades. I remember there was some song or some movie like that back in the day. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, what I mentioned uh, at the start that, you know, there are just 21 million, uh, you know, Bitcoins. Do you think uh, the, the the pricing would be would be halved uh, for, for Bitcoin, like like how it happens for, you know, stocks, like it happened for Apple and uh, other stocks? Or do you think that's something which should not be taken into account? Yeah, so I don't think they'll have any kind of stocks, because remember, every Bitcoin has 100 million Satoshis. So, you know, it's kind of like the, I kind of look at this way. You know how like a dollar has a hundred pennies? A Bitcoin has a hundred million Satoshis. So even though, you know, psychologically, when it seems like the price is high, something's more expensive, that's not necessarily the case, even the stocks, as you go by market cap. But I get the psychology of it. And the stock market, too, when they do do the splits, it does make it easier for some of the small accounts or the retail traders to buy the options because of the pricing. And, you know, in Bitcoin, I don't really necessarily think that really comes into play. So there isn't really any need to say like do a split from like 21 million Bitcoin to 42 million Bitcoin and half the price because Bitcoin has its own mechanisms, you know, with the halving that the miners will be able to only mine half the amount of coins now that, that they can now. And it happens every four years until they reach the maximum supply, which is estimated to be like around 90 some to 100 and some years that we get to 21 million Bitcoin. And I guess, you know, it, when that happens, I guess, you know, the miners and everyone and the people maintaining the network will have to make a decision on what to do then. But that's like 100 years from now, give or take. So I, I really don't think there'll be any kind of split like that. I mean, there's things that they do, like, you know, the hard forks where people got in disagreements uh, in the community and they hard forked oh, into Bitcoin yes. cash. And then they got into a disagreement and hard forked into Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. And then I even heard Satoshi's vision got into a tiff and hard forked into something else. I forgot the name of that already. <laughs> mm. All right. And uh, there are some uh, interesting questions from uh, from uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, Mike is asking, uh, could you please reiterate your point on derivatives of secondary shares being traded? Uh, you know, what, what do you think is the idea over there? Oh, sure. So, you know, in the private markets, um, accredited investors and big VCs can get 
these shares and the secondary market is kind of when somebody has already purchased a share, but you're not buying them directly from the company or the issuer and you're buying them from someone else. And a lot of times they're even in these things called SPV, special purpose vehicles. But I really think to eliminate and democratize that kind of thing where you have to be a credit investor, you have to know the right people to even get in. Because even if you're a credit investor, you can't always get in there. You know, there's a limited supply of these things. But through tokenization, you would create a derivative of a startup like a Stripe or something like a Plaid. It's hard to get the shares. And basically, you know, there'll be like a reference price. It'll trade on the market, but it's not backed by the shares. So it's almost like you're saying when you buy this token, hey, I'm betting this token's going to be higher in the future. So just to make up a random price, if someone pays $100 and someone else pays $101, you know, the person buying it is basically saying that this is going to be worth more than the price I paid in the future, but it's not actually backed by the actual shares. Now, there can be a thing, though, where someone does buy the shares on the secondary market or even owns the shares that they got originally, and then they back it by a token. There could be that too, but I think first there's going to be a lot more of it not being backed and it's going to be a derivative of it because, you know, it's easier to do that than it is to get the shares because then you go back and do well, you have to have the shares in order to back the token or securitize it. I hope that helps. Sorry, and uh, I think uh, Jack, Jack had a question. I don't know if uh, you... If it's possible for uh, you know somebody in the audience to unmute and ask a question. Uh, yeah, Tom, I can. Can, oh, can you hear me? Uh, so someone just raise your hand if you have a question. Yeah, I think Jack. So Jack, I can see uh, you are. If, if you're there. Oh, Jack. All right, let me click on him. So Jack, I'm going to click on your avatar and then I'm going to invite you up to this stage here. So just accept that. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Excellent. Yes, I love that can. feedback from the audience. That's so cool to see. Um, so you guys were talking about derivatives. The other thing that, you know, um, the community, maybe more of like the Wall Street types of people that are really interested in Bitcoin have tried to do a few years ago, and then it seems to be coming back around and, and kind of gaining some steam are the futures markets that surround Bitcoin, where people are, you know, placing bets on the price of what it will be in the future. But given how volatile it is as an asset class, do you think it actually helps Bitcoin as a community to have a futures market where people that don't have a stake in the Bitcoin ecosystem are taking bets on its movement? Is that a good thing or does it hurt for, uh, hurt the ecosystem? So I think it's generally positive because when a regulated exchange like the CME issues futures in Bitcoin and now they have them in Ether, I think okay. that helps make um, institutions feel more comfortable and also brings more adoption to it. I get what you're saying, and some people actually do a cash and carry strategy where they actually hold the underlying Bitcoin and they sell a future against it so they can make the embedded interest rate or do an arbitrage. So some of the people who do play in the futures market are doing it as a hedge also. But I get what you're saying that all this rampant speculation where some Wall Street people are just playing it to the future could be considered a negative, but I think overall, these things are, are positive because it allows institutions hey Don, your mic and more is on regulation right now. that we understand and, and it'll be more fair. Because remember too, when the CME has a future, it makes it harder for the US government to say, hey, I just want to ban this thing. And so your, your feeling is that the ecosystem is mature enough, the technology is mature enough, and the people that are in the community buying and holding and, and using it on an active basis, it's gotten to the point where it can weather the ups and downs of people, you know, maybe with improper behavior, dare I say, manipulating the markets in order to kind of create some kind of price action. You think that now we're at a stage of maturity where, you know, it's robust enough to be able to weather those and support I, I do think we're at that stage of maturity. And, and even to give an example, too, over the weekend, and you know, there's a lot of rumors how this happened, but you know, like on Binance and exchanges like that and FTX, which I love FTX, it's a great exchange, um, they have futures products that are probably a lot less regulated or not regulated at all, like especially definitely not regulated like the CME. And there was some kind of issue or rumor that in the futures market in Binance, something happened, and I don't know what's true and what's not, but apparently there was some scheduled power outage over in China, so the hash power went down, and it caused some kind of rift, and someone did something in the futures market, caused Bitcoin, allegedly, who knows the real reasons to fall, but the futures actually fell below the um, spot price of Bitcoin, which is definitely did happen. So, and Bitcoin weathered that. I mean, we're down a little bit off you know, the, the high of 62, 63,000, whatever it was, depending on where you get your price from. 
But I definitely think, you know, the volatility of Bitcoin is still going to be 10, 20, 30 percent on a regular basis, weekly, even sometimes daily. And it pretty much weathered that storm and it didn't kill Bitcoin. We didn't fall like 90 percent or anything like that. And we did bounce off. I think it fell as low as 50, 51 in, in some cases. I'm not sure where we're at while we're speaking, but I know this morning it was around 54, 55, depending on where you looked. So I definitely think we're mature enough to handle it. And I agree there is some people who will do some manipulation especially around you know expirations and things like that but i think that happens in the stock market and the gold market and other markets that have futures thanks yeah i think uh summer if uh, i don't know if i'm pronouncing it incorrectly i got a question about xrp if uh, if you're there, you know, do you want to come on the stage and talk about your question? Yes, um, can you hear me? Wait. Uh, you want me to come on the stage? Uh, well, uh, sure. I'm here. Do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, sure. So my, my question was, um, why, if, uh, what's the difference? How come Bitcoin was able to catch up while um, Ripple XRP, which apparently was created by Ripple Labs, I think in 2002, prior to Bitcoin, but it didn't catch up like Bitcoin did. Is there a reason behind that? Uh, that would like to know your opinion on that. So when you say catch up, do you mean price wise or usage wise? Uh, what do you actually mean by catch up? The whole hype, the price, everything, utility, everything, yes, compared to yeah, XRP. So, right. So just as full disclosure, I, I'm an investor in Ripple Labs through secondary shares. So I do like Ripple Labs. And, you know, I'm actually biased. I think it's ridiculous this SEC accusing of being a security. I think that's going to end up being dismissed. But um, so Bitcoin's a limited supply of 21 million. So as far as the price goes, and you know, Ripple has, I don't know exactly how many Ripple are out there, but it's a, a, the XRP, which is technically separate from Ripple Labs because there's a foundation or something for XRP, I, I think, that um, you know, because the supply is so much more limited than Bitcoin, it's more of a store of value. But as, for, as far as the software and the payment rails that Ripple Labs provides to companies, I mean, that's extremely valuable. And you don't necessarily have to use XRP to use their software and their payment rails. But XRP has its own uses, and I have nothing against XRP, obviously. But um, I just think it's the scarcity of Bitcoin and kind of the, um, I guess, the, the dogmatic following, how they call some people Bitcoin maximalist. And, and it really got, I guess, with the whole thing with even – some people find this weird, but the fact that Satoshi is anonymous, I even think that even adds an air of mystery to Bitcoin. And, you know, Ripple has a centralization factor where it has a CEO, it has a creator, and it has a Ripple Labs company that has something to do with it. That I, I kind of think that kind of keeps it from being as, as well loved as Bitcoin, for lack of a better term. Awesome. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, uh, like Satoshi was, is anonymous and, you know, usually people have an ulterior motive, but this is, uh, this is very interesting that, you know, uh, uh, he hasn't really come out. Do you think it's because of, of fear from other bigger institutions or why, why do you think, or do you think uh, it's just an ecosystem where the idea is to promote a uh, digital world, you know, first digital currency, which is accepted day to day? Yeah, I guess a lot of that, too, um, goes down to who someone thinks Satoshi is or is it even a person. Because I kind of think it's a group of person, and the concept of Satoshi is Satoshi's all of us because, you know, Bitcoin with the Genesis block, with that 50 Bitcoin in the Genesis block, is kind of a symbolism of freedom and a jubilee that basically, you know, with the financial system becoming the way it was in 2009, the banks and all the controversy, that this was like the new freedom, the birth of the Internet money kind of issuing us into the new era. And um, so I don't know that Satoshi is necessarily one person. I mean, nobody really knows. And, you know, we all know that there's a certain group of devs that worked in the beginning. And, and you know, Hal Finney was the first person to get um, an email from Satoshi and received some of the first Bitcoin from Satoshi. But unfortunately, Hal Finney, you know, he got ALS and passed away. 
Now, I know he did that cryogenic freezing, and hopefully through technology one day that maybe they could even bring him back. That that would be amazing, and then maybe he could give us some insight, like, you know, on Satoshi, if he even knew him, or maybe he didn't even know him, because, I mean, the whole thing with the um, back in the day with the um, cypherpunks and the internet cafes, supposedly they were all reached out to via this some kind of um, chat room, so they may not even know who the originator is. And I have a feeling it could even been some kind of supercomputers involved, and it was open source, and they all worked on it together. So it's kind of like a mystery in itself. But I just kind of think, you know, the idea of Satoshi is really all of us, and that was kind of the freedom where we're going into internet money into the new revolution, that it almost doesn't really matter who Satoshi is. It might be a woman too, by the way. Everyone always says it's a man. How do we know it's not a woman? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, are, there, are there any more questions from the audience? I think this is going great. You know what's interesting too, if no one has a question, that Monero also has an anonymous founder. They, they gave some name, something Saberhagen or something. And some people think it's the same group of people who invented Bitcoin. I mean, who knows if that's true? And it's interesting now there's a new social network, BitClout, where the um, founders yep. are anonymous. So there is something to this anonymous stuff. BitClout's pretty interesting because you can make your own profile. I made one, and you don't have to use your real name. I called myself Asian Cowboy, and then you have a social token. So, I mean, it's pretty pretty cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, interesting. You, you're talking about BitClout. Uh, you know, can, can you talk more about it? Uh, I, I think... Uh, it's it's like a new type of decentralized currency. Isn't it? Yeah, so to me, BitCloud is like, you know, the new kind of social network where everyone has a social token and a value can accrue to them because when someone buys your social token, some percentage, you can set that on your profile, is actually locked up that's supposed to accrue to you. So I think the default was 10%, so I just stayed with the default. And um, it's interesting because creators, you know, their, their creator coin can go up in value. So if people are betting on you by buying your creator coin and taking it up in value. So it's interesting, too, because there's some people like Elon Musk. I think the last time I checked, it was the most valuable creator coin on the, on the platform. But officially, he's not on the platform because it says, you know, he can claim this profile is not yet claimed. So that, that, that's pretty interesting. But I definitely think that I don't know if it's going to be Big Cloud that makes it, but this concept of the future with social networks and goes back to branding and becoming, you know, the Internet of you even is is really going to be the future. And something like this could be like as, as big as Facebook or the next Facebook or the next evolution of, of social media where it's decentralized and it gives kind of the power back to the people, for lack of a better term. Interesting. And uh, does, does somebody uh, can anyone be a part of Bitcoin, or is it is this something? You yeah, can any, 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 anyone can join now. I mean, you can go to to BitCloud. I don't know if it's dot com or dot org. I forget. But you know, if you Google the BitCloud, and then you can you can sign up. And um, I know originally when you first joined, you had the option of um getting some free BitCloud to get you started. But someone texted me yesterday and asked me, you know, how much BitCloud do I have to buy? And I said, did they give you any free BitCloud? Like a really small amount. It was like $7 or something at the time or $3. I can't remember what it was. And he said, no, they didn't. I said, well, I think there's an option to buy $50 worth of BitCloud to get started. Because I know when I joined, they gave you the option. They gave you like some free, a very small amount. But then you could buy a BitCloud for like, I think it was like $50. I don't know if it was, I can't remember if it was a whole BitCloud. But I was like, oh, this is cool. You know, I'm going to buy $50 worth too. The strange thing, though, about BitCloud that a lot of people don't like is it's hard to get the BitCloud out. So you can buy BitCloud, you can send in Bitcoin and get BitCloud, but you can't necessarily withdraw BitCloud. And it's its own blockchain and stuff. I think eventually, you know, as it evolves, you'll be able to take BitCloud out and maybe even withdraw the creator coins in your own wallet. And a lot of people start, you know, rumors or get suspicious, but I don't necessarily think there's anything nefarious about that because if they created truly a new blockchain, there's no self-custody wallets that you could send to that could hold the BitCloud. So that would be one reason that would be a totally legitimate reason to do it this way. Because I, I always believe, you know, everyone's good until proven otherwise. So they like start at 100, you know, I'm kind of trusting. And then, you know, if they do things to lose that 100, it, it goes down. But, you know, I give them the benefit of doubt because for one, it's innovation or doing something really cool. And what necessarily reason would they have to even do something nefarious? Because people don't realize Bitcoin is pseudo anonymous. It's not 100% anonymous. So if someone was to take like 100 million of Bitcoin or whatever's going in there and then say, oh, by the way, rug pool, we're, we're outie, that Bitcoin can be traced through chain analysis. And when it's that kind of money, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, it would be traced and blacklisted and whatnot. So, yeah, I don't really think anybody would necessarily plan out a scheme to take in hundreds of millions of dollars and then say thanks to the memories. 
right and, and you know the, the other uh the new new services like you know online cryptocurrency loan services like nexo uh and blockfi uh, and you know crypto.com where you can get interest rates from you know any, anywhere from 3 to 12% and they they also give you loans uh you know, there's a lending service especially from from nexo uh do you think uh individual investors should uh should invest uh from one cryptocurrency and put it on on a on a nexo or a or a blockfi and uh, you know take a loan and take more interest do you think that's the right strategy to go about So I'm I'm definitely into um let lending out your crypto and you do take on the counterparty risk. So I yeah. definitely think people should do that if they want to get an interest rate it's up to each person but there's definitely value in those platforms just realize the counterparty risk you're taking and do a little bit of research if you can get it who their counterparties are. There's also an exchange called Voyager which is interesting. They also have a public stock that trades in Canada where you can go on there and certain cryptos you can get like I think it's 6.5% on Bitcoin, 5.5 on Ethereum and like 9% on USDC and I think it's even 2% on Doge. Don't quote me on the Doge one, but I think I saw that on there. So yeah, I definitely think that's a strategy someone can implement. You don't necessarily have to be considering angel investing, it could just be a yield strategy. Just be mindful, especially on the platforms that are decentralized, that you are taking on counterparty risk when you lock these things up in smart contracts. It's just like all the yield farming and the staking and liquidity tokens. liquidity provider tokens on Uniswap and PancakeSwap and all those things and sushi are great things, great innovations, but you are um subject to counterparty risk or or if a certain defi product that's giving you a high interest rate gets hacked and gets drained, that's one risk you're taking. Well, um uh, you know if it's a uh, the normal questions, you know, I like to uh, ask what you know what is the best way people can reach out to you and, and more about you. Yeah, great. So if if people google me, all kinds of stuff comes up. And um but you know they can follow me on Twitter. It's um at primal key. Um I'm even on TikTok now, the Asian cowboy doing some trying to play the guitar a little bit again and stuff on there. And um what the fuck? I'm on Instagram. I think I think someone else had Asian cowboy. So I think I'm Asian cowboy 12. Yeah. I picked I picked 12. I don't think there's 12 other Asian cowboys, but I picked 12 because Tom Brady's the goat and he's number 12. And um I'm trying to think if there's any other social platforms. I just joined Twitch, but I, I can't remember my handle on there. I haven't really done anything on there yet. But it's it's pretty easy to find me and, and probably the easiest way is just to follow me on Instagram and Twitter and on TikTok now cuz I think you can send people messages even on TikTok. I'm trying to learn as much as I can about that platform. I don't have that many followers on there, only like 100 or something like that. <laughs> I think uh, Oh, and if they join uh, BitCloud too, they can follow me on BitCloud. They can even buy the creator coin if they want to. Oh, nice. Right. Uh then thank you thank you so much for for taking your time and uh, you know don't need to get. Oh, we have follow- Oh, that's right. I see on the thing follow I'm not following anybody apparently on this account, but it's a new one. I can't remember if I on my phone, so I could probably follow myself because this is actually I had to do a new account to do it on my computer this morning to come into here. So yeah, they can follow me on RoomKey. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I just started pulling you. Yeah. Thanks so much guys. That was awesome. Really enjoyed the conversation. Let's clap it up. Thanks man. Appreciate it. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm headed to the next meeting. It was great. Great conversation. Thank you to you both. And thank you everyone for coming and and joining and listening and asking great questions.